across planet Internet, self-appointed scientists are filming outrageous acts of science. These Internet heroes are doing bizarre experiments, making extraordinary inventions, and creating amazing scientific stunts. We've gathered a team of top science brains to analyze just how they do it, why they do it, and choose the very best. It's science, but not as you know it. So stand back and don't even think about trying this at home. We mean that. In this show, we're smashing things up with the kings of carnage. Internet impresarios who bring chaos, mayhem, destruction, and harmless vandalism to science. Kings of carnage. I want crash, bang, science. Now I'm really looking for people that are committed to breaking things apart and just finding out how things work on a fundamental level. These guys, destruction is not just an art form, it's a science. So now that we know what it takes to be a king of carnage, let's get ready to rumble with number 20. <laughs> Our first royal wrecker is a world champion anvil shooter. I was completely unaware that this is what people are doing for fun these days. With over 2 million hits, Gay Wilkinson is the most watched anvil shooter on the internet. We caught up with Gay in Missouri as he prepared to help some anvils get airborne. You smell the powder, you see the flash, you hear the deafening sound. It's almost too much information to process in that couple seconds that it happens. They talk about the joy of sex, but it don't last like the phone shooting ambush. <laughs> it's only afterward you think. I like to watch it again in slow motion because there's too much to take in. Good idea, Gay. Let's watch it again in slow-mo to see how gunpowder can propel 110 pounds of solid steel skywards. There's three things that are going on here. First is that you're generating a lot of gas. The second is you're generating it really, really quickly. And the third is that there's a very good seal in between the two anvils which prevents it escaping. This is Acme Anvil Sealant, and this is actually peanut butter. Using peanut butter as a super sealant, Gay gives the explosive gas an extra split second to ensure maximum thrust. But why does the anvil go straight up? We've got Newton's third law at play here, and that is for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Now, that gunpowder, when it's lit, produces gases, and they try and shoot out in every different direction. Now, they can't push the earth. It's too massive. The only thing that's got to give in a system is the anvil. So what happens, instead of the earth moving, the anvil shoots far up into the air. So, imagine a 110-pound lump of metal falling 17 stories, moving as fast as a car on the highway. Yeah, probably not the greatest spectator sport. If you're going to err, err on the part of staying too far away rather than too close, because it's a deadly force. It, it can kill you. We don't want to do that. Behold, Thundershit, a king who conjures up carnage with his legs. Thunder, 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 thunder. Thundershit, a.k.a. Grandmaster Yearly, became an internet superhero the moment he tried this. Thundershin painfully kicks his way through three wooden baseball bats using only his awesome superhero shins. This must hurt so much. I mean, just by watching it. I was just like, oh. In this dangerous stunt, he took 20 seconds and five strikes to break through the bats, raising the important question, just what's the secret behind his superhuman shins? Thundershin probably is not in as much pain as you think he is. He's practiced this. All you have to do is just keep hitting something like your shin repeatedly, and the bones will repair themselves and repair themselves until they've thickened to the point where you are Thundershin. When you make tiny little fractures in your bone, new pieces of bone tissue come in and fill those in. In his case, he's just chosen a body part, the shin, and whacked it repeatedly to cause more bone growth to make it thicker and thicker. He quite rightfully could boast the title strongest shin in the world. I also can't imagine him having much competition. And from a superhuman that uses his shins for destruction to a couple of guys that use their melon. 
At number 18, we have a couple of gentlemen who are willing to wait for carnage. Doug Alback filmed his buddies Alex and Steven making a fruit salad with 241 rubber bands. Wait for it. Wait for it. It's almost... There. There's something about the simplicity of putting elastic bands around a watermelon that really appeals to me. So, is this melon bending to the rubber band's will? When you stretch an elastic band, you can feel it pulling back. In fact, the more you pull it, the more it tries to draw you back in again. And when you first put them over the watermelon, they're quite stretched. And eventually there's enough of them that the watermelon starts to get squashed. But as it gets squashed, the elastic bands contract a bit. They're no longer pulling as hard. That's why they have to keep adding them. And the more it squashes in the middle, the more elastic bands they need to squash it a bit further. So by the 241st band, there's enough force for liftoff. But how are the melon spheres produced? We're only applying pressure to this one ring around the middle of the watermelon, and that's the one bit where it breaks, just, you know, cutting the whole thing in half. This is Roger Russell. And uh, what do you have there, Roger? I have 50 pounds of silly putty. This epic video shows North Carolina State University getting crazy with silly putty from a height of 60 feet. As a materials engineer, I love silly putty. I mean, look at this stuff. You can take it, you can bounce it. At the same time, you can squish it. Sometimes you can stretch it, but if you try to stretch it too fast, it breaks. How it behaves depends on how much time it's got to react to the forces that are being applied to it. If you whack it really quickly, the molecules that make up the, uh, the silly putty don't have time to get out of each other's way, so it appears more solid the harder you hit it. It's amazing stuff. But it looks so squishy. This is actually made of liquid silicon, which is glass. So when you give it enough of a whack, it's going to behave like solid glass, which of course, shatters. Now you might think you're looking at a hurricane from space, but that looks like this. What you're actually seeing is an army ant vortex. Captured by Canadian Milton Segura while vacationing in Guatemala. It put even our ant-loving experts in a spin. I've never seen it before, although I see ants pretty much every day. Ordinarily, they leave the nest en masse to overcome any prey that they happen upon in what they call these swarm raids. They communicate with each other by touch and by pheromone signals that they leave on the soil. If one ant happens upon an old pheromone signal, it can send them off on a trail which will lead all the ants behind it. Ah, so the ant carnage is caused by misplaced pheromones. So, what explains the swirling mass? Some of the ants from the front will circle around and actually rejoin the ants at the back. And this has a cascading effect where the rest of the ants just start following and these circular vortexes form. They'll just go around in circles until eventually they, they may die of exhaustion. In one case, it was observed that the swarm was about over 300 meters in diameter, taking each ant, you know, hours and hours to complete the loop. Luckily for Milton's ants, they work through the chaos and escape their cyclone of death. Free to march and swarm again. So far, our kings of carnage have shattered silicone, accelerated anvils, and shown us super bones. But coming up, it's carnage like you've never seen before. We're demolishing buildings, starting avalanches, and wrecking an MRI scanner. All this and more on... Outrageous Acts of Science. Welcome back to our countdown of the world's most destructive kings of carnage. As the destruction increases and we head into the top 15, our experts are looking for even more ingenious ways of destroying things with the power of science. So where better to resume the countdown than killing things with a laser beam? <laughs> This is Scott Stevenson's world record attempt to destroy 100 balloons with a laser beam.
lasts for quite a while on that last balloon. Is it gonna go? Yes! Victory for lasers. We track Scott down in his underground lair in Paris, France. Remember, playing with lasers can be very dangerous, so don't do it. I really wanted to do something that I'd never done before, so I took a laser and I positioned it at one end, and I put a balloon at the other end, and I saw if I could pop the balloon, I could probably pop them off. My goal was to start it, let it do its thing. The laser is heating up the surface of the balloons, and so the molecular bonds inside the rubber are starting to loosen up because of the heat that moves the molecules around, until the bonds are not strong enough to hold the rubber together, and then boom, it pops. So the laser isn't penetrating the balloon, just heating the surface. But how can a beam of light retain its popping power all the way to the hundredth balloon? So lasers are created when you excite an atom with a voltage. The electron releases a photon. And when these photons bounce back and forth between two mirrors, they actually help create this laser as the light becomes more and more focused every time it bounces back and forth. A laser doesn't have more power than a light bulb. The only difference is the laser power is extremely concentrated. And that's why you can keep a laser going for a lot longer distances than you can white light. So why did Scott pick his weapon of choice? The beam is quite remarkable in uh, how visible it is. I think that's the, probably the main reason why I'm, I'm such a fan of it, because that, that beam is just so spectacularly visible and uh, unmistakable. Unmistakable indeed. When we arrived, Scott had already moved on to his latest experiment, a laser versus 100 pieces of touch paper. Now, if you like dominoes, the internet is the place to be. But there's only one domino clip that makes it on our list for its sheer scale of destruction. Behold the world record tumbling dominoes, created by Dutchman Stefan Schuppers. This is the video that puts all other domino videos to shame. They've all got dominoes that are the same size. How boring is that? It all started with a tiny push. And it's not a trick. How can that topple a two-story high mega domino that weighs as much as a grand piano? In the process of erecting these tall dominoes, they used a crane, and so they pushed them up against the force of gravity. So when they're standing there, they have a huge potential gravitational energy in them. You can think of it weirdly as each domino is a kind of gravitational battery. You're kind of storing the energy by putting it upright. And this can be transformed into moving energy. And that's basically what the piece before is doing. It is toppling and leaning against the big one with just enough force to tip it past the skipping point and converting all that potential gravitational energy into real moving energy. So potentially, how far could these dominoes of destruction go? Unfortunately, this can't practically go on forever because if you reach the 38th domino, that is going to be bigger than the biggest building on Earth. Theoretically, you could do it, but you might have trouble guessing planning commission. <laughs> Now, this next clip is something you should never try at home or on a trip down the Amazon River. You're looking at genuine piranha scissors. I can't imagine needing a pair of scissors badly enough that I'm going to grab a piranha with my bare hands. This is all the piranha can do at this point. It's out of the water. It's being held very firmly. So the one thing it can still do is open and close that powerful jaw. So what's behind these destructive dentures? The reason this piranha looks like a pair of scissors is because of a very powerful rope-like tendon that attaches to its bottom jaw. And they can bite at a force of 30 times their body weight, which is higher than any other animal, even animals like alligators. This is a great evolutionary adaptation. It can cut through all kinds of things, not just flesh, but bone. You get to a time when the piranha is really hungry, doesn't have a lot of food to eat. It needs to be able to take maximal nutritional advantage of any animal that wanders into the river. After the incredible display of chomping, the little fellow was put back into the river. <laughs> Next time, he might not be as obliging, so please don't try this at home. If a piranha bites off your finger, that happens once. You don't make that mistake again. Stick around for more Chains of Carnage on Outrageous Acts of Science. Welcome back to Outrageous Acts of Science. At number 12 in our countdown, it looks like a curious block of blue gas. 
But what you're witnessing is a substance known as Aerogel. And for the next 25 minutes, it saves the chocolate from certain death. Dr. Steven Steiner from Boston wanted to demonstrate the amazing properties of this weird blue stuff. Well, Dr. Steven, we're impressed enough to get our hands on it. I have never done this before, just to be quite clear. On the actual palm of my hand, I can't feel anything. Even if I hold the blowtorch directly onto the aerogel, this is a bit scary. Oh, it feels like it's cracking. Okay, stop having fun and explain to us how it saves chocolate from destruction. Air and gases in general are really poor conductors of heat because all the particles are really far apart, so they can't transfer the energy very easily. Now, in this aerogel, they can't move about, so they can't conduct any of the heat, so we've got a poor conductor of heat trapped within it. But also, the bit that does make up the aerogel is silica. Now, silica is itself a really poor conductor of heat, a great insulator, and so it's the combination of the two that means we have this super substance that is able to withstand really, really high temperatures. But the silica bonds can't withstand the heat forever, and after 25 minutes, it gives out, leaving our brave piece of chocolate to the mercy of the blowtorch. If they could make suits out of this, we'd be on the sun, wouldn't we? We'd be literally traipsing about on the sun. This is Jason Nesbitt with his fully loaded Glock 22, ready to show you some very dangerous bullet sights. First, it might look like this guy has a vendetta against ice, but then you realize that actually, uh, he's trying to show us something pretty cool. Having spent many days in a Minnesota gun range, Jason realized that if you shoot minus nine degree ice enough, things get a little strange. There it is. Right there. There it is. Yeah. Same thing. It sits there and spins. Uh. Well, that was unexpected. So how has Jason turned his bullet into an icy spinning top? What's happening is that the inside of the barrel of a gun is rifled. So it's composed of all these helical grooves that actually get the bullet to spin. So when the bullet is ejected by the gun, there are two things that are happening. It has linear momentum pushing it forward and rotational momentum, which is making the bullet rotate. The bullet bounces off, lands nearby, the forward momentum is lost, and now the bullet is left with its rotational energy, and now the only way that that can be dissipated is via friction with the ice in the air, of course. Jason, we salute you and your freaky bullet for proving that happiness is a warm gun and a cold spinning bullet. There's no damage to it at all. Our scientists are seeking kings that have mastered carnage, or at least they think they have. But sometimes carnage finds its king, and that's exactly what happened in our next clip as we enter the top ten. Ebar Nygaard and his sons Frederick and Eric found themselves in this highly unstable situation when they tried to cross a bridge in Norway. I wouldn't want to be anywhere near that bridge if it was shaking that much. Yes, that is a wobbling bridge. Ebar and his sons were caught in 75 mile per hour winds. So how can wind shake a concrete bridge? One of the problems with the suspension bridge is that while it's holding it up, there's nothing holding the bridge down. And so when you get these heavy winds, it actually starts to act like a wing and the whole bridge can start to lift up. So the winds are buffeting the bridge. But why are the waves traveling up and down its length? What's happening is the wind is actually exciting the bridges at some of its natural frequency. You can almost think of it as a uh, guitar string or something. It's going to have different waves along it. And basically, the wind starts exciting those frequencies, and that bridge gets going. But were Ebar and his sons in any real danger? Back in history, there was a bridge called Tacoma Narrows and the wind hit it and that created huge oscillations in the bridge and the bridge actually collapsed yeah thankfully this bridge is well designed preventing large oscillations and a cataclysmic end to this video our intrepid bridge surfers were free to enjoy the ride so far kings of carnage have witnessed chaos ricocheted with angular momentum and lasered up some sweet destruction but coming up, our kings get mightier and more powerful on Outrageous Acts of Science. Welcome 
welcome back to our Kings of Carnage countdown. So far, we've seen kings commanding anvils, silly putty, and shinbows while destroying everything in their path. But our next king of carnage is a true king who's ready for war. <laughs> In slow-mo, seeing it cut through can after can after can, that was pretty cool. Yeah. Max McCarter is a self-taught swordsmith, making weapons that increase your odds of surviving a zombie apocalypse. We were hanging out in a sword shop, and the idea came up, hey, why don't we make swords specifically geared for the zombie apocalypse? Max's online video demonstrates a newly made samurai sword sharpness by slicing 24 zombified beer cans at once. So, what is it about Max's sword that lets him cut through beer cans like butter? It needs to be moving very quickly, and it needs to be very sharp. And he has to do this can after can after can, so the blade needs to be heavy as well to continue the momentum. It also helps that the cans are shaped like a cylinder, because as the blade comes in, the initial point of contact is tiny. Therefore, you have this massive force hitting at a very focused point, so the pressure is enormous. And that's why he can split the can in two. So a super sharp blade with a lot of momentum produces epic pressures on the sword's edge. But how did Max slice through all 24 cans? To transform all the potential energy stored in his muscles into such a straight line and a beautifully conserved velocity, then you have to have an amazing technique. So you have to drive power from your toes and your hips, but without changing your level. And that's the trick to it. Guess it's more dangerous to attack a pressurized can of beer than a zombie, huh? Is there something you're not telling us, Max? I want to reassure our viewers that no beer was harmed in making this video. We respect beer. And the beer was drunk, and the cans were empty and filled with water. Beer drinkers. Staying with booze-related carnage, this is Bill Beatty from Seattle, proving that when it comes to online destruction, the humble beverage container leads our scientists punch drunk. I do like experiments where step one is drink some beer. Three dollars a bottle. Okay, hang on. We've never seen anyone doing this in a bar. What's in that bottle? Magic beer? Beer is no good, ordinary water is no good. You have to have water that has been sitting around for a while and has got rid of all the gas inside it. Only then will this trick work. When you hit the top of the bottle, it forces the glass to move very quickly downwards, but the water takes a little bit longer to move that distance. And these little bubbles appear, little bubbles which are actually vacuums. Air can't get in. It's effectively an empty cavity. Now, that cavity is directly underneath all this water and a fraction of a second after it's formed the water is going to catch up it's going to come flying down the cavity is going to implode and that sends off such a shock that it blows the bottom of the bottle out no one truly knows how the cavity collapses so fast to blow the bottom of the bottle off but what we do know for sure is that it's an amazing party trick <laughs> There was a time when magnetic resonance imaging scanners were expensive hospital tools used to diagnose illness. But everything changed when a bunch of students got their hands on a decommissioned MRI machine and showed the world some super magnetic carnage. You're talking about a million dollar machine and you're kind of letting people play around and see the real power of it. These Californian carnage makers were pulling with a force equal to one ton, begging the question, how? In a normal magnet, you have electrons moving in a coil that creates a current that creates the magnetic field. But these normal electrons would need a lot of resistance inside the coil. However, if you cool down the coil to an incredibly low temperature, that means the electron can move freely and it can move at incredible speeds. And the faster it goes around the coil, the stronger the magnetic field is going to be. And that's how you get these incredibly strong magnets inside the MRI. 
because the current is flowing in a superconducting loop, it will keep on flowing infinitely forever and ever. Everything these guys put into the machine is stuck there until they can turn the machine off. That's why you can only do these sorts of experiments when you're decommissioning a machine. They had only one option for recovering their office furniture, destroy the machine. In this decisive moment of ultimate destruction, the supercooling helium gas was released, shutting down the machine for good. An epic end to a destructive day's work. It's not often that you're driving down the Arizona highway when the gates of Hades open up in front of you. The guys driving this car are definitely kings of carnage because instead of turning on their tails and going home, they've driven straight into the eye of the storm. After a four-month drought, this mighty hubbub, that's Arabic for strong wind, swallows Phoenix. So how did this hubbub get so unbelievably big? The thing that triggers off the dust storm is the thing that everyone wants. It's about to rain, but this is the worst possible way for it to happen. Hailstones and raindrops start falling, but before they can get anywhere near the ground, they're evaporated and melted by the heat. This cools down the air. It cools it down a lot. So you end up with a, a huge amount of cold air sitting on top of very warm, very dry air. Cold air is high up and warm air below. That's not right hot air rises, doesn't it, above cold air. So suddenly this cold air is a lot more dense than the air below it. So this then comes down to us in something that's called a downburst. Once that splashes against the surface, it kicks all the dust up. And that makes your dust storm. Falling cold air, dust, and a car. The perfect storm for any monarch of mayhem. Our kings of carnage rule over land littered with destruction. They've launched anvils, destroyed dominoes, and driven into dust storms. But as we climb up the royal family tree to the top five, we'll see the true meaning of destruction. After the break, more Kings of Carnage on Outrageous Acts of Science. Welcome back to our Kings of Carnage countdown. The thing about Carnage is that it's unpredictable. Mike Brunson thought he was in charge when he tried to do a home demolition of his corn silo. Get out there with a sledgehammer and do it yourself. How hard could it be? But things didn't go according to plan. Oh, they could shoot. Oh, no. Fail. Fail indeed. But let's just see around 220 tons of concrete in motion one more time. So happy it was an epic fail because when I saw this thing, it really looked like the silo was gonna fall on that guy, and I didn't want to see that. Standing 65 feet tall and 16 feet wide, the concrete structure stubbornly stayed upright. So why? The structure of it is perfectly circular and, and upright, so what happens is there's a lot of compressive force going down. So much force just lined up perfectly vertical with this that the little disturbance it has at the bottom still isn't enough to set this thing swaying to the point where gravity could take over and it would fall. Having escaped death thanks to the silo superstructure, Mike doesn't give up. He realizes he needs to shift the silo's center of gravity. Huh. Now, how would a farmer do that? You can tell this guy, he's, he's had it with this silo, right? He's going to defeat the silo. So what he does is he gets his tractor, and then he pulls it down. Yes. Human one, silo zero. Well, it may have been a brush with death, but this video racked up more than 2 million hits online, making Mike a worthy king of carnage. <laughs> The perfect place for snowmobiling. And it's where we meet our next king of carnage, Tim Patton. Here he is, having fun. But in March 2011, Tim's fun was seriously interrupted. As I come up to the top of the hill, I give it a quick blip of the throttle to sink the rear end. I step off of the sled, and boom, I feel the, the slope take off, and I'm off to the races, down to the trees. Immediately, the snow starts to suck you under, so I was swimming hard to the left, 
trying to get to the other side of these trees and I'm feeling like if I don't miss these trees, it's not going to be good. I feel the initial impact and then immediately I'm being pushed hard with hundreds of pounds of snow, both legs wrapped around the trees and thought for sure my legs were going to break right then. We didn't know at that time how badly Tim was hurt or if he was even dead. So what exactly had Tim and his snowmobile done to trigger the ice cold carnage? So on the side of the mountain, it's a battle of gravity versus friction. Snow builds up in layers. You get a big layer of thick, dense snow, and then another layer of thick, dense snow on top. But in between, the only thing keeping them together is a little bit of friction. So there's this whole layer of snow that just wants to slip down. It's all ready to go. It just needs someone to come along on their snowmobile and trigger it. As soon as Tim adds his weight with the snowmobile, it's too much. The friction isn't enough to keep the snow there, and the whole slab starts to slide down the mountain. But can white fluffy snow do any damage to a tough dude like Tim? That wall of snow is equivalent to about 9,000 metric tons. Now, that's the weight of about 14 blue whales. And it's traveling at somewhere between 40 and 60 kilometers per hour, which is a really high speed to have a blue whale coming toppling down on top of you. Tim suffered serious ligament damage to both knees, a small price to pay for escaping with his life. So, has this experience changed Tim's taste for the white stuff? I had uh, three months of rehab on both knees, and I was ready for the next winter. As soon as it started snowing, I was ready to go. It hasn't changed me. It's too much fun to think about, oh, it's too dangerous. We like getting far out, and we're looking for a good time every time we go out. Coming up next, it's time for our top three, when outrageous acts of science crowns the king of all kings of carnage. <laughs> Welcome back. We've reached the final three kings of carnage. We've witnessed our monarchs command animals, master magnets, and embrace demolition. This next king of carnage captured chaos rarely witnessed by us mere mortals. There's something fishy going on over here. Fishy indeed. This epic underwater chaos was captured by Octavio Alberto in a top secret subaqua location. I was amazed with the tornado of tuna to start with, but then the guy got in there to give us some sense of scale, and then we could see how amazing it is. You're looking at a live tornado made out of over 100,000 jack tuna, each one measuring around three feet in length. This guy has stumbled across something that only happens really a few times a year. It's the moment when big-eyed jack tuna come together to spawn. Fish do most of their sexual reproduction outside of their bodies. What these guys are doing is getting a large volume of eggs and a large volume of uh, sperm together in one place. And so by doing this cycling, they're basically keeping all of those fluids together in one spot. There's no actual sex taking place, but there's a whole lot of fertilization going on. It's interesting that they shoot this mechanism because it guarantees a certain level of genetic diversity because everybody is basically secreting their goods into this space and it's all sort of mixing together. Okay, it's a colossal chaotic tuna love fest. So, where are all the tuna babies? Fertilized eggs will then develop into larvae and they form part of what we call plankton. It's the very base of the food chain. The ocean is a big scary place. There's a lot of predators that will end up eating them along the way. So basically a very, very small proportion of those fertilized eggs will in fact make it all the way through to, you know, becoming a whole fish. From the deep blue sea to red hot sand, that's about to get even hotter. I'm a chemist. I've seen a great many explosions, but this is almost certainly the most impressive one I've seen. T minus three, two, one, explosion please! You see a military contractor destroying 100 tons of weapons in Iraq. But our experts see a shining beacon of supersized carnage. First 
thing you see is the light that's formed from the explosion. And the second thing is that you notice the tripod of the camera shakes. And this is because shockwave from the explosion has traveled through the ground and is now shaking the tripod legs. And the third thing is that we hear the explosion and we hear the sound. That's a clear illustration of the difference between the speed of light and the speed of sound. Very interesting, but what in the name of science is that? Do you see what looks like some sort of a halo effect? And what this is due to is the expanding gases of the explosion rush out rapidly, and they displace the normal air around them, and you have a region of low pressure. And surrounding this is all of the compressed air of very high pressure. And then surrounding that, you have your normal air. So as this area of low pressure air increases, it gets colder, and cold air makes clouds. For a fraction of a second, you're actually looking at a cloud of water vapor. There's some incredible physics going on here. So congratulations to these kings of carnage for proving that the bigger the bang, the bigger the science. Our kings of carnage have ruled with might over solid centers of mass, light-based obliteration, and avalanche surfing. We've seen shins shattering stuff and daring domino demolition. But our experts have finally chosen the king of all kings of carnage. This king used destruction to save his own life. A coffee shop in England is an unlikely home for our ultimate king of carnage. But this is Gary Connery, by day a coffee maker, by night a stuntman. Master of the wingsuit and no stranger to carnage. So I knew, as soon as I jumped from an aircraft on a wingsuit some eight years ago, that I was able to land one of these things. One of those clips where you don't know what's going to happen. You think, okay, it's a wingsuit, that's been done before, he's just going to pull a parachute and then land. Oh no. Yeah, oh no. Our number one king thinks parachutes are for wimps. Behold Gary Connery landing in a wingsuit, without a parachute. <laughs> He actually survived, but how? That wingsuit is making it possible for him to be moving horizontally a lot faster than he is moving vertically. If he were just to hit straight down in the cardboard boxes, curtains, no chance. Yeah, no chance indeed. A wingsuitless Gary would have hit the ground at 150 miles per hour, which isn't good for any part of the body. So what this guy has done is that he's converting his speed from strictly vertical downward motion to a combination of vertical and horizontal motion. So his wingsuit has a glide ratio of about 3.3. So his speed in the vertical direction is 3.3 times slower than his speed in the horizontal direction. Fiendishly clever. But why use flimsy cardboard boxes? How can they possibly save Gary's life? The trick with the cardboard boxes is that they're able to sequentially absorb energy. It means one absorbs energy, and then the next, and then the next, and the next. And you're able to line up just thousands of these so that when you put it all together, it's a lot of energy, but it's spread out over time. And short impact times is what really kills you. So the longer you spread that out, the better. When you're at that height, the, the chance of overshooting or undershooting is huge. So that's why he had to have a long line of boxes. And also need that long line of boxes to really slow his ascent. So how did Gary feel? Perched 3,000 feet in the air with nothing but boxes to catch him. During the flight itself, you can't stop and think to yourself, how do I feel right now? Am I scared? Am I comfortable? Because you're so in the moment and you're just dealing with everything in each millisecond. Almost the whole field had gone quiet and I had my head in my hands. There was this overwhelming euphoria. The boxes worked wonderfully. The calculations worked out well. I genuinely woke up the following morning with nothing, not a tweak, not a bump, not a bruise. You can see why this guy is number one, because he's got balls of steel. Think about this. This guy's thousands of feet in the air, and he doesn't have a parachute. Wow. 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 So at number one, the man who entrusted his life to cardboard boxes. Gary Connery, you are the ultimate number one.
king of carnage. So while Gary gives us an extraordinary encore, we say adios until next time on Outrageous Acts of Science.